today, this morning, but you all are perfect at showing up right on time. <laughs> but it is good to be with you. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Um, it's sunny. It's pretty warm for the end of January, so let us rejoice in this, the day that God has blessed us with. We had about 80 um, women show up for our annual women's retreat yesterday. Just a terrific, amazing turnout. Um, I'm not sure if this is the most we've ever had, but it's right up there. We had a great speaker, great lunch together, and just a great time to be God's people. We had a lot of women for Redeemer, but also a lot of women from around the community. So just a great event, a great time here at Redeemer yesterday. There are pictures in the newsletter. Please grab a newsletter on your way home today uh, to take a look at some of those pictures from yesterday. Secondly, if you are used to going to the bathroom on the south wing, don't do that for the next two or three weeks. We are currently repairing it. They have really started off well. There's been a lot of um, sledgehammer, a lot of different tools, a lot of noise in the church office the last week or so. Uh, but it's good noise as we begin our building project. The idea is to turn those two different bathrooms into one larger bathroom, so this will take the next few weeks, but our building project has begun. Lastly, we are bringing back the annual Waffle Brunch. This has been a tradition of our church going back many, many years. I have not got to experience this before, so I'm really looking forward to it. We are adjusting the time, though. As I understand, it used to be on a Sunday in the evening. This year we're going to try Sunday for lunch. So it will be held February 27th, the Sunday before Lent begins, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And this is a big thing for our church. A lot of men step up to help prepare and to help cook this. We have a sign-in set. Uh, those are also in the newsletter, so please take a look at that. Way home today, February 27th, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We also need Jello, so if you are able and willing to make Jello, there is a sign-up sheet underneath our confirmation picture. Uh, be sure to sign up to make some Jello for that waffle brunch on February 27th. That's all announcements that I have this morning. Would you please rise for opening him as we lift our voices to God?
most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son, born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are fully forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High. You are adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and love, that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson is taken from Jeremiah, the first chapter. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. In life, your and save me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. You are my prayer and stronghold. You deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the clutches of the evildoer and the oppressor. For you are my hope. O Lord God, my confidence since I was young. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. My praise shall be always of you. Our second lesson is taken from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body, so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end, and as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, I will come to an end, for we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, and when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only a part, then I will know fully, even as if I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. This time I'll ask any boys or girls that might be in church to collect our penny offerings and come on up for our children's message. So come on up, kiddos.
baseball fans, did you know that? In fact, baseball is my favorite sport. I like a lot of sports. I like football. I like basketball. But there is no sport that I love as much as I do baseball. I have a favorite baseball team, and they're the Philadelphia Phillies. Anybody know about the Philadelphia Phillies? They're a pretty good baseball team. It's been a while since they've won the World Series, but I like them. And they play in the National League. But their fans, their fans are known to not always be the nicest fans. In fact, sometimes people think their fans are kind of rude. There once was a player, his name was Del Entz, and he played a long time ago, but he was born in Philadelphia. And the very first team that he ever played for was the Philadelphia Phillies. And you would think that the Philadelphia Phillies fans would love Del, right? After all, he was born and raised in Philadelphia. He was like the hometown boy. It's kind of like here, Hubbard. Our hometown star is Jordan Larson. And we just we root for her. We're so very proud of her. When she won national championships and she won an Olympics, we got so excited because she was ours. And we were just so very happy and proud of her. But Dylan, as you can see him up there on the screen, he was a good baseball player. Actually, he was a really good baseball player. But did you know that any time he messed up, he was an outfielder. And there's a few times he'd be in the outfield, he'd be trying to catch a pop fly, and all of a sudden his glove, and it'd go bouncing out of his glove, and he'd make an error. Or if he was up and it was a big situation at the plate, and the team needed a hit or a home run, he'd swing and he'd miss it. And the fans, and those Phillies fans, they're not always the nicest. And sometimes not nice fans do not nice things. Did you want to know what the Philly fans did to Del Ennis? Start talking. 
please us. And please help us to be excited, to be eager, to hear from him, to learn from him, and to love him. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you so very much, boys and girls. You can go back to your seats.
morning before worship, but thank you very much, uh, Redeemer Choir. Would you please rise if you're able for the reading of our Holy Gospel?
please be seated. I'd like to start my messages off with something a little bit lighthearted. And I heard about this young mother that had two really mischievous young boys. If there was trouble, if there was something amiss, you could almost guarantee that these two little boys were in the center of it. And so she made up this plan to bring her two boys to see their pastor one at a time. The older pastor sat, the older, older son sat down with the pastor, and the pastor looked at this boy and asked him, son, where is God? The boy didn't know how to answer that. The pastor again, son, where is God? And the boy just sat there like a deer in the headlights. Well, now the pastor's getting really upset. He's not answering once again, son, where is God? At this, the boy got up, bolted, left the office, ran back home, went to find his younger brother and said, something's wrong at church. God is missing, and they think we did it. <laughs> Grace and peace to you from God the Father, and from our Lord and from our Savior, Jesus who is the Christ. Amen. Do you have recurring dreams? First, as you take a look at this bed, that looks comfy, doesn't it? And I want to thank you for waking up this morning and coming to church. I know it's a lot easier to hit the snooze button. I know it's a lot easier to say, no, I'm just going to sleep in getting prepared to come to church. So let me say this. Thank you for being in church this morning. Thank you for gathering to worship our God. I know it's, it's a commitment. It's easier to skip church. It's something a lot of people do to just skip church. Uh, but thank you for making that commitment to being in church with me this morning. But back to those dreams. Do you have a common dream that maybe you've had several times. You know, sleep experts say there's a number of different dreams that a lot of different people commonly have. For instance, it's very common for people to have dreams in which they're falling. Have you ever had this dream? You're falling, and you're falling, and you wake up forcing before you hit the ground, but you're falling. Also a common dream is people winning the lottery. Now, I'd much rather have that dream that you win the lottery than trying to figure out, how do I use this? But, you know, another very common dream. Kind of a weird, strange, common dream is a lot of people have dreams where their teeth are rotting and falling out. Kind of a nightmare-type dream. All of us have nightmares. All of us have dreams that come to us not once, not twice, but commonly. I remember when I was about 14 or 15, I had a very common dream that started off great and then ended up very poorly. 14-year-old kid. And in my dreams, I was driving. And I was driving a fast car, like a Mustang and a Corvette, and it was great. You remember being 14 and 15, and you just couldn't wait to drive. There's something about getting to that age, and you have the freedom, you get behind the wheel, and it's great. Can I hear an amen to that? It's awesome, right? And there's something about being that age, and you just can't wait to start driving. And my dream, I loved it. I was going all over the place. I was going fast. I was going slow. But in my dream, I didn't know how to stop the car. I knew how to make it go, but I didn't know how to make it stop. And I had this dream probably at least a half dozen times. At the end of my dream, to make the car stop, I did this. I crashed into a bridge. And it was kind of a nightmare. At the end of every single one of these dreams, I had to crash my car, and it was terrifying. But sleep experts say the most common type of nightmare. There is one type of nightmare that is more common than any other, and almost every single human being has had this nightmare. Now guess what it is? What is the most common nightmare that almost everybody 
big test before you. You're back in school, back in high school. There's a big test, and what did you do, or more than anything else, what did you fail to do? You forgot to study, and you get an F on it. So there's all kinds of different these forms of this type of dream. Maybe you forgot to study, or maybe you slept in, or maybe you got distracted, but you weren't ready, and you failed it. Now, I still have this type of dream. However, my dreams changed. I'm no longer in school, but my dream, typically on Saturday night, doesn't happen all that often, but sometimes I'll have this nightmare that I wake up on Sunday morning, and I forgot to prepare. I had no sermon ready. I didn't know anything about my children's message. My adult Bible study wasn't prepped, and I was panicking. And so I still have this dream, but it's changed a little bit. However, what seems to be a nightmare, and it truly is a nightmare, sleep experts really tell us that this is our brain's way of offering us reassurance. I'll say that again. This nightmare when you're unprepared is really our body and our brain's way of reassuring ourselves. Because when they study this, typically when we dream this, it's a former test that we've already taken in a class that we've already been in, a situation we've already had, and in those past situations, we excel in them. So put yourself back in geometry. You're taking a test, more than likely you didn't fail, more than likely you passed it, and it's just your, your body and your dream reassuring you that you can do this. You've been through this before, you can do it again. So this nightmare truly isn't a nightmare, it's not a bad thing, but it's really our brain's way of telling us that we can get through this. Now I say all this as a lead up to my message this morning. Last Sunday I focused on the Old Testament prophet of Nehemiah. I don't typically preach on the Old Testament passages, but I'm going to do it again this Sunday because we've got another great one. Our first lesson for today, found on page three of your bulletin. If you could pull your bulletin open with me just for a few minutes here. We have no longer Nehemiah, but we have the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is a very, very interesting prophet. He prophesies for about 40 years, and he comes during time of Israel, that there is a lot of danger before God's people. And here in the, the prophet of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is getting ready for a big test in his life. God has something major in store for him, and here we read how God reassures him. Like our brain reassuring us that we've been through this test before, we can do it. God reassures Jeremiah that he too can do it. But I want to dive back in here, page 3, beginning in verse 4, where we read, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I want to stop right there. I love this. I'll say it again. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is reassuring, isn't it? Before we were even conceived, God knew us. God knew who we would become. God loves us. This is how great, this is how grand, grand God is. Before you were even conceived, God had plans for you. God knew what he wanted your life to be. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Essentially, he's telling Jeremiah, I had a plan for you. He has a plan for our lives. For Jeremiah, I had appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then Jeremiah responds, and I love Jeremiah's response. And then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. Jeremiah's reaction, it's natural. And if God came to you and God started to speak to you and God said, you know what? I've got big plans for you. I've got big things in store for you. Some of us would step up and say, I'm ready to go, God. 
You tell me where to go. But most people, if they feel like God's leading them, God is trying to guide them, they get a little bit hesitant. And Jeremiah goes, ah, you know, Lord, I don't know. You know, and it, more than anything else, it tells us he's only a boy. Now, Jewish people, back then and even today, a, Jewish, a young Jewish person becomes a man at the age of 13. Today it's called your bar mitzvah, and it was the case back then. When you turned 13, in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of the community, you were considered a man. So when, so when Jeremiah says he's only a boy, at this moment when God comes to him, he's maybe 12, maybe 11 years old, he's, he's a kid. And your God is telling him, I have big plans for you. I was looking for images of Jeremiah. You Google Jeremiah, I like to find images that I can pull them into the message. And almost every image I found of Jeremiah was of an older prophet. Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years, but at this moment, when Jeremiah first hears from God, he's young. He's a kid, and he doesn't know if he has what it takes to be this prophet, to follow God. He's just a kid. And what does God do? God is good. God is grand. And God reassures Jeremiah that it's, it's not you, but it's me. You're going to be my mouthpiece, but I'm going to speak through you. Look at verse 9. See what God does. Then the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord God said, Now I have put my mouth, my words, in your mouth. God tells Jeremiah, you will speak, and they won't be your words, but they will be my words. I am with you every step of your, of your life. Everything you say, it won't be you speaking, it will be God speaking. Friends in Christ, though, this takes a lot of trust, right? And truth be told, this is something a lot of people aren't good at. I am terrible at trusting. I'm good at trusting if it's nothing too consequential. But if it's something that's really, really important, you know who I trust more than anybody else? Right here. If something really needs to get done, if there's something big and it really has to have a lot of attention and it's, it's really important, I have a hard time trusting other people to get it done. I'm not saying that I can't do it, I just have a hard time doing that. And even God. I know I trust God, and I know you trust God, but when push comes to shove, most of us trust ourselves more than anybody else. I think we Lutherans are sometimes just as bad at this as any other Christians, and maybe it's our German heritage, that sometimes we're stubborn, and sometimes we have to have it our way, and sometimes you know, someone else comes into our life, and no, you know, I, I can do this myself. But God is a God who needs us. God is a God who wants to be a part of our lives. God is a God who wants to direct us in our lives. He wants to lead us forward. Now, later today, raise your hand if you're watching some hope. Okay, not as many hands as I hope to. I was hoping to see 90%. We, we need to do better than that, Redeemer, okay? There's some good, great football games on today. And if you watch the Chiefs versus Bills game last Sunday, that's a out as good as it gets. That might be the greatest football game I've ever seen in my life. It's hard to say what the greatest one is, but boy, just back and forth. It got me thinking, though, as Christians, what position, of all the different positions on the football field, do you think we are most suited to play as Christians? For instance, as Christians, are we meant to be the quarterback? Are we meant to take charge? Are we meant to call audibles in our lives? Are we meant to be the star in the world, the star in our lives? Or as Christians, are we meant to be the running back? Well, God gives us the ball and we bulldoze through that line. And we go 80 yards and we're, we're dodging people, we're taking the ball. Or maybe, or maybe we're meant to be the offensive lineman. We're meant to protect, you know, those important people in our lives. Or maybe we're meant to be a defender. You know, we go with the sack, and we go and we disrupt things, and we're meant to, to just go in and, and just blow things up. However, all the different positions, 
that I think that we could see ourselves playing as Christians. I think Christians were meant to be the receiver. Say that again, that we are meant to be wide receivers. There's a blogger, his name is Bob Lotick, and he was talking about this man up on the screen. And Hayden back there, he found out I was talking about Tom Brady. He's not very happy with me. And I know there's probably a lot of people not happy with me talking about Tom Brady, but he's the greatest of all time, all right? Or they love him, like him, or you just get tired of his winning. He's the greatest. And he's the greatest not because he's the fastest. He's not the fastest. He's not the greatest because he has the strongest arm out there. There's quarterbacks that can throw it faster than he does. He's the greatest because he trusts his receivers. He trusts his linemen. He trusts his team. And there's a financial blogger that says that Tom Brady is the best at leading his receivers. Meaning when he throws the football, he's throwing it to a position on the field that the receiver is not currently in, but will soon be. And sometimes he'll throw it, and it's 10 yards away from the receiver currently as he is the greatest at leading his receivers to where they need to be. That is what has made him so great. And here's where Bob Botech makes the connection between us as Christians, trusting God as our quarterback in life, along with Tom Brady. Bob Botech writes, With God, when you follow his principles, the results are almost always delayed. As in, when God asks you and me to do something, we rarely see the results of it immediately. But we have to keep doing what we know God told us to do, running and trusting that God will get us the results, the ball, somewhere downfield. He says, if I were playing catch with the NFL quarterback Tom Brady, and Brady said, just start running, and the ball will be there when you get there, I will trust him. He has seven Super Bowl rings that prove he can sufficiently get the ball to receiver downfield. How much more can we trust God when he says, just start running? I'll take care of the rest. Whatever, whatever you are trusting him for today, says Bob Lotick, just keep running and trust that he's got it all worked out. I love that. We as Christians, we're, we're meant to be receivers. We don't always know where God is guiding us. We don't know where God is always sending us in our life. We often have a sense of it. But God says, run. God says, trust me. God says, the ball will be there. God says, I will guide you. I will direct you. Just run. When things seem complicated, when things seem all out of tilt, just run. Just trust. God is our quarterback. God is our God. He is good. He is guiding us. He is leading us. But we have to trust. We have to follow. We have to believe. And God will guide us. Amen? Amen. Our offering basket is placed in the back of the church on the table there with a black cloth on it. Um, thank you, thank you for your offerings and your gifts. Um, they allow us to do our ministries here at Redeemer, so um, your offerings and your tithes are greatly appreciated. But let us pray. Gracious God, your word made flesh brings harmony to all the earth. As we offer ourselves in these your gifts, prepare us to receive the grace and truth and renew in us the song of your salvation. And Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess the Christian faith that we hold in common, using the words of the Apostles. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you please stand if you're able as we sing our sending them songs of thankfulness and praise.
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.